Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Dr. Peter Kozlowski. Dr. Peter Kozlowski uses a broad array of tools to find the source of the body's dysfunction. He takes the time to listen to his patients and plot out their with their history on a timeline considering what makes them unique and co-creating with them a truly individualized care plan. Currently, he works with patients online and in person, so he's virtual, via his Chicago, Illinois, uh, and Bozeman, Montana-based offices. Dr. Cause did his residency in family practice, but started training in functional medicine as an intern. He trained in the clinics with leaders in his field, including Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Deepak Chopra, and Dr. Susan Blum. And I'm not sure if it's Blum or Bloom, so forgive me on that. So uh, without further ado, let's dive into this episode. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we talk about how important your liver is to your overall function uh, because it's going to be the first place a lot of these toxins end up. So you really want to make sure you're sweating, eliminating, processing everything out so that your toxins don't get stored elsewhere. But I want to leave the science to Dr. Kaz, just trying to give you a little rundown. We talked about hormones and uh, the imbalances that you can have in your body, what to do when the toxins and the hormones are causing havoc in the body, how to have great gut health, the things that you can do, the things that you can do to detox the body, and what to do as you're getting older, what kind of tests you should run, what you should be looking out for. And we went into detail about parasites, um, stomach acid, gut health, uh, probiotics, and the process of elimination, how important it is, how often you should be doing it, and what your bowel movements should look like if you're truly on the path to health. This was so good. I enjoyed it so much. You're going to love it too. And make sure you check out our other op, uh, episode with Dr. Kaz. He also has a new book out, Get the Funk Out. And he says that's functional medicine. Um, but I'm also like, get the funk out. Like, get the crap out of your body, right? So I hope you guys enjoy this. Without further ado, we're going to dive into the episode with Dr. Kaz. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Kozlowski to the show again, and Dr. Kaz for short. Yes, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be back. It, it's so, uh, it was so awesome. Your episode was well listened to last time, all about the gut. And That's great today, to hear we're going to talk about hormones, which I know is going to perk up some of my listeners' ears uh, because you could be doing everything right, but your hormones could be out of whack and you don't see the results that you want or else you're emotional or there can be so many things. And I love that you're here to help us understand how we can take better charge of our hormones. So what uh, what do hormones and toxins have to do with each other? Sure. So as your listeners know, my, my first book was all about gut health and food and mental, emotional, spiritual health. Well, those are three out of the five main areas that we focus on in functional medicine. So when uh, when I work with a patient, the whole point of working with me is to get at the root cause of disease. And there's five areas we look, and they are food, gut health, mental, emotional, spiritual health. And then the last two are hormones and toxins. So that's what my new book, Get the Funk Out, is all about is about hormones and toxins 
and it seems even to me when I was writing, when I came up with the idea, I was like, this seems kind of random, but people are always asking me the why, right? And so if I diagnose someone with a low thyroid or with Hashimoto's or with adrenal fatigue or with low testosterone or with estrogen dominance, the everyone always wants to know, well, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And I believe that a major reason our hormones are so screwed up is our toxic environment. And when I say our toxic environment, it's basically everything. And most of the stuff that I never thought about growing up or even thought about when I was training as a regular doctor, it's the what we drink out of, what we eat, what we breathe, um, what we actually drink, what the what's done to our food supply, um, personal care products. The average woman is exposed to over a hundred toxins before leaving the house. And, and in the first chapter of the book, I go through my wife's normal morning routine of just going to bed, getting up, having breakfast and getting ready for the day and how many toxins she's exposed to. Um, and we don't think about these toxins because we don't feel them. We're not taught to worry about them when you're putting on your mascara or you're straightening your hair or your lipstick or when you're making a smoothie in the morning or when you're playing with your dog's toys or when you're feeding your kid with a bottle. You're not taught to think like, hey, the, the plastic that this is made out of may be disrupting my hormones. Hey, the mercury um, that's in the fish that I'm eating is damaging my cells or um we're just not taught to think that way because the people that are making this stuff are making a lot of money and, and they hide the fact that these substances might be harmful for us. And over the last 50 years, every year, more and more and more toxins are introduced into our environment. Well, also over the last 50 years, Hashimoto's is way more common, right? Um, Autism. Why, the rate... why is that, that the Hashimoto's is way more common now? So my argument is, is because of the toxins is, is because that these were absorbing all of these toxins. And, and from, again, from my first book to my second book, uh, the analogy I give is we're all born with a bucket and we fill that bucket with stress and lead and mold and glyphosate and gut issues and bad food. And eventually that bucket overflows into disease. And that could, the way I was taught to think of the thyroid specifically when I was started training in functional medicine, the thyroid is like a sponge for toxins. And so that's why I think Hashimoto's and, and low thyroid is so common because our thyroids are full of toxins. And what the immune system, what is an autoimmune disease? An, an autoimmune disease is when your immune system identifies your own organs or tissues as an invader. And so that what Hashimoto's is, is that your own immune system has identified your thyroid as an invader. Well, we could take the traditional medicine approach and be like, we have no clue why that is happening at such a higher rate than it used to. Or we can think about it alternatively and think, okay, well, you know, we're being exposed to so many more toxins than we used to be. And so if they're getting stored in our thyroid, maybe that makes sense that our immune systems are attacking our thyroid. Um, so the, the issue with this is, is that there's not a du direct like causation study, right? So I can't prove that exactly if I test you for heavy metals and you have a bunch of lead in your body and you have Hashimoto's, I can't run a test to, to prove, yes, the lead is what caused the Hashimoto's. Um, it's we're learning how the body works and we're learning about all these things that we're being exposed to and how they're accumulating in our bodies. And we're correlating with what's happening with disease. Um, so that, in my opinion, is that's why the connection of this book, um, why that I connected the two topics of hormones and toxins, um, is is that is because why 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 are so, why did I get diagnosed with low testosterone when I was thirty two? Why are men getting diagnosed with low T even younger than me? Why do three out of every four women that come in my office? 
get diagnosed with estrogen dominance. Um, these, you know, adrenals, thyroid, uh, blood sugar and insulin and, and all these, you know, these hormonal abnormalities are uh, increasing at an at a extreme rate. So why is that happening? And my argument again is, is that it's this increase in our toxic environment. So what sort of toxins are we encountering daily and how do they affect our hormones? So the most common toxins that I find in people are heavy metals. And so like the layout of the book is basically the first five chapters are about the hormones. So there's a chapter on the thyroid, the adrenal glands, male hormones, female hormones, the pancreas and blood sugar. And then there's a chapter about the most common toxins that I that I encounter. And so the first one is heavy metals. And the two most common heavy metals that I find in people are lead and mercury. And lead is coming from airplane exhaust. The highest levels I've ever seen in somebody was a, a mechanic from O'Hare Airport. Um, he had okay. 140 times the amount of lead that he should. Wow. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, lead is coming. I mean, being from Chicago, a lot of the pipes were made from lead paint was made with lead. Um, so lead is literally everywhere. You breathe it, you drink it, you touch it. So that there's that. And then there's mercury, which the most common exposure is from fish. And so the main cause of that is coal burning plants that that release the the dust into the air and that settles in our oceans that gets into the the bottom fish which then the bigger fish eat them so the bigger fish are the ones that usually have the most mercury something like tuna um example being is is I've seen people with huge levels of mercury that are eating sushi like 3 times a week or more um well how do we get this how do we chelate this mercury and the uh, lead out of our body once we've absorbed it. So time and, and, but it, for example, like everything in your body has a half-life, that's the clearance time. So like, let's say my level of lead right now is a hundred. The, the half-life is 20 years. So it would take me 20 years naturally for that level to go from a hundred to 50. And in order to totally clear something, it would take five half-lives. So if you're exposed and you just naturally wait to detox the lead, it would take a hundred years. Um, so no. what we do is you're actually- You're going to be dead by that point, probably. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then that's zeolites? actually- zeolites? Do you believe in using zeolites or anything like that? So I mostly focus on uh, chelation therapy, okay. um, using chelating medicine, uh, the most common one being DMSA. Um, and so I, I get really deep into that. DMSA? Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's, is that a prescription per that you have to get for that? It is a prescription. Yeah. So it, we, we get it from compounding pharmacies. Okay. Um, there's... Two other alternatives that are pretty common. One is called DMPS and the other one is called EDTA. Um, but the most common for most physicians is DMSA. And this is a strong medicine. So that's, that's I, I really get into it in the book um, about the benefits and risks of it. It, it is a medicine that is approved uh, in the traditional medicine world, but only for like a, what they call a severe heavy metal toxicity. So that one that is someone like acutely got poisoned. What we're talking about is total body burden. How much have you accumulated over the years? And so just in general, like let's say we're exposed to lead in the air, right? And so our barrier is our skin and our lungs. And that's our for those are our first detox organs. People don't really think about those. But so the, the lead tries to get in through the skin, it tries to get in through the lungs, the lungs try to spit it out with the with the fluid with the um, alveoli and the fluid that's made in the lungs. The skin keeps it out, but through a thick barrier. But let's say that lead gets into the body and it gets into the blood. The first place that the, the lead goes is our liver. And that's what most people know is our detox organ. 
And what the liver does is detox. It is called phase one and phase two. And it mm, makes yeah. that lead. I'm familiar with that. So lead, any of these toxins. So we're talking about lead, mercury, mold, glyphosate, um, the plastics, et cetera. They're fat soluble. So what that means is if they do cross our skin or our lungs and our liver doesn't do anything, we will store them in places like our uh, thyroid or in our adrenal glands or in our testes or ovaries um, or in our cardiovascular system. But like I said, lucky for us, the first place that the lead goes is the liver. So the liver goes through this two-phase process called detox. What it does to that lead is make it water soluble. So you can then poop, pee, and sweat it out. And that the liver's ability to do that is limited. And I think that's what happens. So what, what I mean by that is we can all detox a certain number of toxins a day. So let's say my capacity is 100 toxins a day. If in an average day I'm exposed to 50, I'm fine. But then let's say all of a sudden I move into a moldy home and I'm binge drinking on the weekends and I'm not filtering my water and I'm living close to the airport and now I'm exposed to a thousand toxins every day. Well, 900 of those are going to get absorbed. And that's what's going to create that total body burden that I'm talking about. And that might cause disease in a week. That might cause disease in 50 years. And that's what makes toxins so dangerous is we don't feel them. You don't get symptoms from you know your water being too high in lead or from eating fish that has too much mercury. Or if you're breathing in mold, most people don't feel it unless they're allergic to it. So that's what makes this so dangerous is we don't know it. We're constantly absorbing it. And then all of a sudden, one day, your doctor tells you you have Hashimoto's or that you have diabetes or that you have high blood pressure or that you've been, your family members have been diagnosed with dementia. And it, the regular doctor will tell you, I, I don't know why this happened. It just does. Well, again, my argument is, is part of the reason why is, is this increase in our toxic environment and that our liver can't keep up. And then we're so stressed out that we're inhibiting our body's ability to detox. We're not sleeping. We're not drinking enough water. We're not pooping every day. We're not exercising enough to sweat. Um, so that that's in my opinion, what's happening. And so once these, if the, if there's so many toxins crossing the liver that the liver can't get rid of them, they're going to start finding places to hang out because they're, they're there. So um, all of our cell membranes have, are, have fat around them. So every cell in your body, the membrane around it has fat. So a fat soluble toxin is going to get stored in that membrane. And one of their favorite places to hang out is the, the um, endocrine organs like the thyroid and the adrenal glands mm. and the, the ovaries and testes. Wow. Okay. What are the seven um, hormone imbalances in the human body that, uh, you know, people have? So there, there's definitely more um, than that. And I tried to focus on the ones that I see the most. And so for me, the most is going to be the thyroid is number one. Number two, maybe 1A is the adrenal glands. Um, blood sugar, which is insulin, which is probably the most common one that, that's in America, but not in my practice specifically. Most people that come to me have already been working on their diet. Um, for women imbalances in estrogen and progesterone and in estrogen dominance is the most common thing I see. And then testosterone in men, uh, low T at younger and younger ages. So I would really pick those five as, as the most common, um, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, and then the reproductive hormones in men and women. How do you think the toxins are triggering the imbalance? Because when they get stored, they cause cell death. And, and I go through the exact cycle, but basically they cause oxidative stress, which, which is basically um, creating almost like an acidic environment around the cell 
which is causing the cells to the mitochondria to get damaged. The mito all of our cells have mitochondria in them. Most people know the mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cells. So the mitochondria get damaged, and then eventually the cells die. And and so that's that's the mechanism, and that's why you know I'm I'm focused on hormones mostly, but the other systems. So if I see anybody with immune issues, I'm going to look at toxins. So that could be autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis, um, the nervous system. So when I work with the families of autistic children or, uh, dementia patients, um, I'm looking at toxins, uh, the, the hormones we mentioned, and then the cardiovascular system. Um, in, if people read my first book, they'll know, I like to use stories from patients. And, and in this book, in, in the heavy metal chapter, um, I go over the story of a guy who came in that he was on three blood pressure medications. And we found he, he worked in the automotive industry, which is always a signal to me to look for metals. And we detoxed him from lead over the course of a year, a little over a year, he got off of all three of his blood pressure medications and his cardiologist had no clue why, but was super excited about it. So they cause cell death. And then there's, like I said, the four main systems that they affect is the hormones, the immune system, the nervous system, um, and the hormone and the cardiovascular system. So how can, you know, we help ourselves out? Like, I know some of the things I do and you can tell me good or bad, but I take Mac. Um, mm -hmm. I, I take milk thistle, uh, drink water, lots of water, a gallon a day. I sweat pretty much daily. Uh, yoga. I have an infrared sauna that I'll sit in and I try to eat clean and organic, but I, I once upon a time had, uh, heavy metal toxicity. It was high. Uh, and it was found in the blood test and the hair analysis. Uh, and that was, I was eating a lot of fish mm -hmm. uh, for, for a competition. Uh, and it was orange roughy, which is one of the highest mercury fish. And mm -hmm. then I also had the That's fillings, awesome. but they used to place them under the gum. And so they were leaching into my bloodstream because they were, you weren't catching it on the x-ray, but they were decaying. Mm -hmm. And so I got those uh, abated by like a biological dentist. She Beautiful. took them out the right way. Uh, I did, you know, the way where you like the zeolite kind of thing. Uh, but, but the night and day, it really affected my thyroid. But night and day difference in the energy level that I have now at 60 versus my 40s when I was going through that. You're doing all the things that I would recommend. Okay. Um, I, I like to keep it super simple. And so because the whole process of detox is making toxins that are fat soluble, water soluble, the way we're getting rid of them is peeing, pooping, and sweating. And so th those are things that the average person should be doing every day, right? And that is just, I always recommend half your body weight in ounces in water a day. So if you're 160 pounds, it's 80 ounces of water a day. So just drink enough water, mm -hmm. sweat daily, um, exercise and I love infrared sauna. In in the the second most common toxin that I treat is mold toxicity. Oh, okay, and actually, yeah. the the best thing for mold toxicity is infrared sauna. Um, oh, I love that because it makes you sweat, but also the infrared ray infrared waves can kill off some of the mycotoxins that the mold releases into your body. So I I love infrared sauna for sweating, and then get your gut right which is all my first book is all about mm -hmm. unfunking mm -hmm. your gut. And okay. so even if you what don't do you have think about that, sauerkraut with the probiotics in it, do you, do you think we should do it with food or do you think we should do it with probiotic? I'm always all about food. Um, 
Yeah, I, I prefer to do it naturally than, than supplements. But um, me just being a physician, I, I like to really rely on testing. Um, so I would test your microbiome, you know, and, and, and I would test what's growing. Do you have probiotics? Do you have dysbiotic bacteria? Do you have candida? Do you have parasites? Uh, explain to everybody, because uh, I like it when the doctor is talking, but then I like to make it so the 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 average person understands some of the language, like the dysbiosis. Can you explain to everybody like what that is and, and how Absolutely. do they know if they have it? So what it dysbiosis is an imbalance in your microbiome. And so all of us have three to five pounds of bacteria growing inside of us. And, and when that bacteria is good, we refer to it as probiotics. They live in your large intestine. And, but what can happen is, is those bacteria can become imbalanced. We can start getting the wrong kind of bacteria overgrowing our guts. And that is what is called dysbiosis. The simplest analogy that I use is, is that your microbiome is like your own garden. And in that analogy, the plants of your garden are the probiotics. Fiber is the fertilizer of your garden because your, your probiotics need to eat. And that's the biggest way that in America, we're kind of killing our microbiomes is we don't eat enough fiber. So our gut so bacteria- So fiber from plants or what What would you uh, suggest? Grains, fiber? plants, okay. fruits. Okay, beans. Beans, sure. Yeah, any of it. Um, so we're not feeding our good bacteria, but we're constantly being exposed to bad bacteria. And when that bad bacteria starts taking over, it is like weeds overgrowing your garden. And that's what dysbiosis is, is weeds overgrowing your garden. And just for anybody listening, the way your microbiome starts is when you're born during a vaginal birth, the infant picks up good bacteria from the vaginal canal. The way that we test your microbiome as a baby or as an adult is through the stool. We do a stool collection. Well, they've done stool collections. We call it a stool analysis on babies that were born by C-section. And when you're C-section, you don't go through the vaginal canal. You go straight out the belly. And they've done stool tests on babies born by C-section, and they find the same bacteria that was on the nurse's gloves growing in the baby's gut. Wow. And that's one out that of every three powerful. people are born by C-section now. So that's one out of every three listeners probably that are at risk for dysbiosis just because of being born by C-section. Speaking of which, my daughter is going to be delivering her my second grandchild next Congrats. week. Um, and, you know, you think about these things because it could be a C-section if all right. doesn't, you know. So uh, I, I love all that you're mentioning. Now, I use Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. I believe I love 100%. that brand. Yeah. Because it's food, it's fermented over a period of years. And, um, but I don't take any other probiotics uh, per se. I take theirs and then I like to eat the sauerkraut probably once or twice a week. I'll have some, some sauerkraut. Uh, what are your other favorite ways for people to get their probiotics? Um, miso. It comes from organic soy. So I, I like to make like a dressing out of uh, organic miso. Um, I get it off of Amazon and keep it in the refrigerator. Um, so that's fermented soy. There's things like kimchi. Um, then there, the most common one that people are familiar with is, is like yogurt and kefir, um, kombucha. When it comes to like yogurt and kefir. I like kombucha a lot. Yeah, my wife loves it. She always has it in the fridge. Um, but a lot of people are afraid of the dairy component of yogurt or of yogurt or kefir. Um, in my first book, I talk all about an elimination diet. In my opinion, if you're not sensitive to dairy, which I go through in that book, how to explain it or how to test yourself. But if you don't have a problem with dairy, I'm okay with dairy, yogurts, um, or kefir. Okay. So but when, there's also like the, you know, if you are sensitive to dairy, which most of my patients are, you can do a 
coconut milk uh, kefir and almond milk kefir. There's yogurts oh, that are, good, are made but... out of. <laughs> right. But I've had it, options. but I'm like, it doesn't taste as good. Now, that being said, my father had allergies to so all sorts of things. And one was wheat, one mm. was dairy. And he would have to blow his nose every day and have the phlegm in his throat. Um, and so I noticed when I eliminated, because I didn't go get an allergy test, eliminated dairy for myself personally. Um, not that I don't have it from time to time, but for the most part. Um, eliminated dairy and eliminated wheat. I don't have to blow my nose every morning. I don't have, usually have phlegm in my throat. So I figured that that was some sort of an allergic reaction for me. Um, and so I, I caught that back. And also I don't get the tummy bloat when I don't have those two things. Those are the two most common. So um, it, it just medically... I think we have, um, I've been taught to be careful with calling it an allergy because an oh, allergy okay. is more of an anaphylactic response. I which knew I was be... having a response to it that I didn't like. But we, we just call it a sensitivity, okay. um, which is way more common than an allergy. But it's just a way that people can get like yelled at or, or kicked out of their doctor's office if they say allergic, they're allergic to dairy but the allergy test says no. So it's, it's a sensitivity, which the traditional medical world doesn't really. Uh, I actually anyway. think I like that word better because I've had people come back saying they're allergic to eggs. And I'm like, see, like what I found was if I want to have Ezekiel bread, cause they used to bake it home, like fresh at fresh market. And I would go and I would get it cause it was so good, but I could only eat it twice out of the week mm -hmm. if i ate it more then i would automatically notice because it has wheat too yeah. um my belly would bloat and so like i I've, I've noticed like i can have oatmeal which is really by the way not gluten free even if it says it because it still has a certain amount of gluten in there uh if i have it more like again if i have it more than twice a week then I notice it. You're you're lucky that you could have it twice a week. You know, there's a lot of people that are so sensitive they can't have it at all. Um, so, but it, it that's important information to figure, you know, to learn about your body a lot, you know, because if people aren't, we're not taught that way. Like if you go to your doctor there, if you go in with like bloating or, or, or say that you, you have abdominal stuff, they're going to tell you to take an acid blocker. They're going to give you a medication. They're not going to say like, Hey, maybe try cutting out gluten or dairy and see if that makes a difference. Um, but you know, for any of these symptoms the there's usually a, a reason why, and that's what we're taught. That's the difference between me as a family practice doctor, I was trained as a regular medical doctor, is if you came to me and said you were having heartburn, I would say, here, take an acid blocker. Whereas if you come to me now and say that, I'm going to be like, well, let's look at your diet. Let's look at your let's gut. Let's see if you have, if you have enough uh, HCL or let's see if you, exactly. have, if you are actually have enough acid. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, these are all very important things because so many people will be just ingesting um, anti-acids like their candy, thinking it's going to make them feel better. But it, in actuality, the problem is that they're, they don't have enough digestive juices. Yeah. I, I mean, that it's, you know, it's just so different that the the seventh most prescribed drug in America is an acid blocker. And if you walked into your local pharmacy, there's an entire aisle of acid blocking drugs. Well, in Unfunk Your God, I, I go over that actually m the overwhelming majority of those people actually have low acid and they're making the problem worse. And the symptoms are in the beginning were caused just due to a food sensitivity and then they're continuing to eat that food and then they're taking an acid blocker. So they're not digesting and it, it just, everything spirals and gets worse. So definitely that's, you know, diet. And then step two is, is for unfunking your gut is to make sure that you're digesting and that you have enough stomach acid. 
And then, like I said, then I really rely on testing. Um, so I, I would test you for, you know, with a stool analysis, with an organic acids test, with a SIBO test and with oh, the toxin. Yeah, because you could be taking, you know, over the counter probiotics, right? And taking too many, like they have millions and millions. Uh, it's not the same as Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. Let me just say, you're taking millions of these you don't even know if you're taking the right one. And then all of a sudden you're all swollen up in that upper intestine. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's, it's, that's where I come down to testing. So I, I can diagnose what exactly is growing inside of you. So what kind of probiotic do you need? Um, do you have an imbalance of bacteria? Like if, if you're, if you do have dysbiosis or SIBO and you do start taking probiotics, you're not really fixing the problem. You could be making it worse. Um, because the bacteria are imbalanced. So mm -hmm. yeah, and that's it, what people don't realize. They don't realize that, you know, they think, uh, you know, a little is good, a lot is better. And yeah. they are probably taking a lot more, you know, when they're getting the problem, and they're actually compounding the issue by taking too much of too much probiotic. Exactly. Now, I interned with Ian Louise Gittleman. Are you familiar with the Fat Flush Plan? No. Okay. She's written 30 books on nutrition and health. Um, wow. And so, like, a lot of what you talk about, it, you know, she was my mentor. And so, like, literally, I feel like I'm talking to her right now on, <laughs> on all of this. And she likes to go in depth. At dinner, mind you. Now, if you have a weak stomach, you don't want to be talking about the process of parasites and uh, elimination. But she really went into depth about the stool, like the color of it, whether it floats, whether it sinks, um, if it snakes, you know, like, like she went into detail about how the importance of having healthy bowel movements like how to know if like just by looking like versus having you know maybe you can't run out and get a test but like you know if the you're simplest way fiber, is is you should be pooping a snake every day that that's the the simplest way um to and then we go <laughs> you out we heard it here first guys <laughs> <laughs> pooping a snake um I heard that from Dr. Terry Walls, um, <laughs> but yeah, that that's, and that's, we got into the, the gut talk, just talking about, you know, how someone can detox and, and that's a, a, a good marker of, if you're wondering if you don't have access to a functional medicine doctor, are you detoxing a great way to, to tell is, are you pooping every day and pooping a snake every day? Um, because those toxins, when they leave the liver, they get sent out in the bile. And so bile is goes from your liver to your gallbladder and then into your intestine. And the intestine, when it flows through there, it gets pooped out. Well, bile has two functions. It, it helps you break down fat as its digestive function, but it also carries the toxins out. And so if that bile is full of toxins, right? So the toxins got into your liver, your liver broke them down and they get sent into your gut to be pooped out. So you get rid of the toxins. Well, if you haven't moved your bowels in three days, right? What's going to happen? Those toxins are just sitting there in your gut. They That's get reabsorbed. 70% of women are having yeah. like, they're not having enough bowel movements like really shouldn't you be having two to three per day if you're actually eating all the vegetables and the fiber and drinking the water and moving yeah. and moving yeah yeah absolutely not once a week not twice a week no and and so that you know that gets into two problems is one is that there's probably gut issues and then number two is that if there are toxins that are trying to be carried out they're getting reabsorbed. And so that's how people just get on this, this hamster wheel and just get sicker and sicker. Cause it's like, you get that affects more... your joints, right? If you're, if oh, you're yeah. reabsorbing all these toxins, they love to go to the joints too. They, they, they go back anywhere. And so it, it's, 
affects the hormones. It affects the joints. It affects the blood vessels. It affects the immune system. And then your immune system gets weakened, then you get sick and then you, you know, then you're stressed out and you can't sleep. And, and so all this stuff just spirals out of control. And then your estrogen becomes too high relative to your progesterone and your estrogen dominant. Well, you need progesterone to detox as well. So then your detox capacity is even worse. And so now you just keep spinning around and then you go and, and you're now on a, a medication for your rheumatoid arthritis and wow. then yeah. that medication is not working. So then you get on a more toxic one and then you need to take all this, uh, these other meds for the symptoms from the first med. And, and, and I mean, it sounds crazy, but that's the, the typical person that goes through the, the traditional healthcare system. Um, and it all it's started with care. simple stuff, right? <laughs> well like care. Yeah, like not being cognizant of of what the risks are of being born by C-section, of being stressed, of not eating enough fiber, of not exercising, of not sweating. And, and it's like all of a sudden disease happens and it's like, well, why did it start? And that's what we try to figure out in functional medicine. But a lot of times it could get back to the basics of just identifying your food sensitivities, drinking enough water pooping at least once a day, um, getting enough sleep, you know, meditating, um, that, that kind of stuff is, is where it all begins and, and things that people can do to, to start turning it around if they're waiting to see a functional medicine doctor, or if they can't right now. Um, but the point of then seeing someone like me is that I would test your heavy metal levels. I will test the amount of mold mycotoxins in your body. I will test the amount of glyphosate in your body. I'll test the amount of, um, a huge one that I find is flame retardants. Well, why, why would you have flame retardants in your body? Huh. They cover all our furniture in it. So in uh, case there's a fire in uh, your house, shoot. okay. I, I go over studies they uh, memory foam mattresses, right? The, those are relatively new in the last few years, but you can order a mattress that comes in a box, like, you know, tiny little box that gets delivered from Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and then you pop the box open and this, all of a sudden you have a king size mattress. Those memory foam mattresses, they found over 80 different toxins um, in those mattresses. And that's where you're sleeping that that's sleep is when you should be restoring sleep is when you should be preparing to fight the fight the next day. Well, if you're sleeping the whole time and just breathing in toxins, that's not good. Um, or like you're carpeting, right? Carpeting is full of, of toxins and, and it's going to have the organophosphates in it too. Jeez. Um, we get, I get into EMFs, right. And, and you know, whether it's, 5g or 4g or, or the, just, you know, people sleeping with their phones next I to, I got to stop. I got mine right next to my bed and I know that's bad. Oh yeah. You got to stop yeah, that. Got to stop it. I know. And we probably have 5g. I want to back up just a little, cause I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So if, you know, <laughs> when I went on the cruise, I taught on the cruise to lose with Anne Louise Goodleman and she talked about parasites and link because her uh, significant other, James Templeton, who uh, runs Unikey Health Systems, he literally had, he was on the cancer ward to die, like terminally ill. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left in the middle of the night. He said, that's the only reason he's alive today. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and he, he got on like a macrobiotic diet and he, he met Anne Louise who found he had tons of parasites mm -hmm. and basically uh you know they they did the detox to get rid of all that which took a while i'm sure so they talked about parasites and length now i wanted to ask your opinion is the best defense besides making sure you wash your food you don't eat raw uh, fish you know or pork or whatever uh, is it the acid in your stomach that's the best defense against parasites or what would you say? I would say it's just a total balance of your body. It's it's making sure your blood sugars are controlled. It's making sure your immune system's not weakened. It's um, it's definitely making sure that you're making enough acid. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's making sure because that you have a healthy off. microbiome yeah. oh, because some of those good probiotics can help keep um, the bad stuff from mm -hmm. taking over. So to me, it, it, it's, it's a big picture thing of, of all of it is, you know, not eating inflammatory foods, um, making sure your pancreas is working, that your bile is flowing. All of those things, I think, make a difference to um, whether it's parasites or any other kind of um, prevention is it, it's just a, you know, to the best of our ability, a total you know, balancing the body as much as possible, or in that analogy that I like to use is emptying your bucket is, is getting all that stuff out of your bucket. I mean, I, I go into it, you know, the, my favorite thing to talk about is the stress component. And the biggest reason that people have low stomach acid is stress. And it's that sim, you know, they call the gut, the second brain. And I got get into the whole gut brain connection and when you're chronically stressed out, your sympathetic nervous system is activated. Your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight system. So it's it's what should be activated if you're out hiking in the mountains and you see a grizzly bear, right? It's, it's not what should be activated when you get out of bed in the morning. But that's what's happening to us, especially if you're sleeping with your phone by your bed, you not even out of bed and you're checking emails and texts and the news and or you're and in right. a relationship where maybe somebody's kicking that that in right yeah yeah absolutely and so that sympathetic nervous system what it does is shut the gut down because the gut needs energy and energy comes through blood flow and so if the body thinks it's in survival mode, it shunts the blood away from the gut mm, and to the brain so and sense. to the muscles to survive. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's not cortisol. enough, yeah. And so if there's not a, enough blood flow going to the stomach, then you're not going to be making stomach acid. If you're not making stomach acid, then you're not going to be digesting and you're not going to be killing off all those bad bugs. So then, you know, it, it gets... It can be as simple as just like dealing with childhood trauma, dealing with, you know, mm, family relationships, sure. dealing with, with spouses yep. and kids that can, mm. dealing with that can restore your stomach acid, which can then prevent the parasites or anything else from taking over. Um, so that's and rest where, and digest, right? Like, that's like maybe parasympathetic. You're, you're doing the, the cooking you know, you do the meal, you set the atmosphere, you relax, and it isn't like this hurried stuff your face kind of thing. Yeah. Even just like thinking of gratitude to the person that, yeah. that you know, harvested what you're eating or, or that if you eat um, animals, if the person that took care of the animal or, you know, was the mm -hmm. animal well treated or being grateful to that animal like that little things like that, like just being, you know, practicing gratitude or breathing can, can activate your stomach to make acid um, mm -hmm. because right. it puts you into that rest and digest and that parasympathetic yeah. response I mean, versus you... what most people do is like you said, is like, you know, now everybody's going through the drive through and like get out of the driving in traffic <laughs> as driving in traffic as they're eating like a breakfast sandwich and they're on the phone and it's like well you're not going to be digesting that and you don't even want to be digesting what you're what you picked up at the drive through you you kind of want to just poop that out my my book i have a chapter in my book get out of the drive through and into the kitchen make sure you guys all read it <laughs> <laughs> but also um eat carrots not crap is another chapter <laughs> love it <laughs> but like i i think like i like to say things in a nutshell that people remember because it's it's like you know do your first workout in the kitchen that's the most important workout of your day love and, it. you know 85 percent of your health your results like it's it's gonna come from what you're putting in to your body and i believe in reading like for the most part, as much as I can, I got to know what am I putting in to my body? 
Because that that's I mean, it's it's a I mean, it's great, great, great advice, because what you put into your body turns that's what your body has to work with. Right. So, you know, if you're putting in crap into your body, your your cells are going to not be able to function like that. That's another reason there's so much thyroid dysfunction is because or immune dysfunction, because your thyroid and your immune system are totally dependent on vitamins and minerals to function. Well, how do you get vitamins and minerals from your diet? Mm -hmm. So if you're in that drive through, you're not getting any vitamins and minerals mm -mm. and you do that for enough years. Well, yeah, sure. The thyroid's going to, you're going to get low thyroid or you're going to get autoimmune disease because you've had 10 years or 15 years or 30 years of not giving your any nutrition, any support to your organs that need it to function. Um, so it does start with that. It does start with, you know, eating carrots instead of crap and, and getting out of the drive through. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's a good place to start and just eating real food real whole foods that haven't been sprayed with a thousand pesticides or shot up with a million hormones and antibiotics like you know eating as clean as you want to feel would be um what i recommend and it's crazy if you did a detox or you did a fast and you know how you get this euphoric feeling this mental clarity and I've just got to think it's because you're cleaning out all the garbage out of your system. Totally. Yeah. It's crazy how just not eating can make you feel better. I mean, it's just like such a funny concept that like, you know, just by putting down some of the stuff we're eating, you can literally just turn around the way you feel. Your body could process then everything that was there. Cause that's the other thing the liver is just such an important organ. And if it's overloaded with too much, it can't do what it needs to do. Like it's got to filter your blood. It's got to process the fat. Like it's got all these jobs. And if you're overloading it, I think you could see it around the middle, like that it's not processing. It's not doing its job because it just has too much to do. That that's another great point of all this of all this stuff being connected is when I talked about phase one and phase two of detox, those processes are totally dependent on nutrients. So you need things like glutathione, which is made from NAC. You need B12, you need vitamin A, you need vitamin C and zinc and all these different minerals and vitamins for those processes to function. So just like I was mentioning earlier, if if your diet sucks, you're, you you can't detox because your liver is trying to get rid of all these toxins. Well, it doesn't have the nutrients it needs to do that, so it can't do its job effectively. So that's it's a double kind of whammy again of how people become toxic is you're you're taking in all these toxins, you're breathing in mold, and and you're drinking alcohol, and you're you've got lead and mercury and all this stuff, but then you're also not eating the nutrients that your body needs to get rid of it. So then you're going to get even more toxins. And, and again, it just spirals again. Mm, so much good stuff today. Uh, my, my last question before we go is what do you think people should look for as they are aging? Uh, like what, what kind of things would you recommend that they do or don't do? Um, since, you know, I focus on testing and, and what is underlying in our body. And for me, so when somebody comes to me for osteoporosis prevention or dementia prevention, um, ideally someone's coming to me for, for prevention, but most people are coming because osteoporosis already started or dementia already mm -hmm. started. Right, right, right. For prevention. Yeah. I would do, if I could just pick one test, I would do heavy metal testing and, okay. and I recommend pre and post chelation testing. Um, and I explained that thoroughly in the book and that's using I that, your book today. Thank you. Um, that's using that chelating medicine DMSA to pull out what's stored in your body and to see how much lead or mercury are sitting in your body. If you've ever been exposed to a water damage building, so if your house has ever had water damage, I would test you for mold. 
um, and we can test the amount of mold toxins in your body. It, I would test everybody for their glyphosate levels. So that glyphosate um, comes from Roundup. Um, it's mm, some people okay. have heard of it. Some people have not. Mm, um, okay. It was made by a company called Monsanto, which mm -hmm. a lot of people are familiar with. My, kind of, my aunt worked there. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So Monsanto. For years on end. Yeah. So glyphosate, um, I get into the history of glyphosate and, and how common it is, but they basically, it's sprayed on everything. And, mm -hmm. and for 20 or 30 years, they argued that it was safe and they settled the largest she, lawsuit. She got Crohn's. In, did she? See? Yep. The, the largest lawsuit in the history of America was settled a couple of years ago, um, $10 billion mm -hmm. to 80,000 people with cancer. And that's something I didn't get in, even really into is the connection mm -hmm. of cancer and toxins. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, we can test the amount of glyphosate in your body through the urine. Um, and so a national news article recently uh, said that they found glyphosate in over 80% of urine samples. In my practice, it's, it's probably 95% of people have glyphosate. So, and you have no 95%, clue. You don't feel it. That's a huge number. Yeah. We, that's we why we got to be everybody. looking at that test then. Yeah. So I, I would do all of that testing and, and because that's stuff that's sitting in your body that you don't know, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. You'll get diagnosed with it, with an autoimmune disease one day or mm -hmm. dementia or high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, why? Well, if we would have started testing your toxin levels, mm -hmm. I think we should start testing toxins from the age of like three or five mm -hmm. personally. Okay. But if, if no matter what age you are, if you haven't had your toxins tested, that's the first thing that I would do. And, and in the, in my book, get the funk out, I explain what tests, how to do them, what labs, and, and then it's just about finding a doctor. You're, you're, you can't go into your, unfortunately, into your family practice office and they're going to know what a pre and post chelation test is. But if you, I, I'm a functional medicine certified doctor. Do you do you, virtual? I do. I do. Okay. Do, That's good for people virtual. to know. Yeah. So if, see, so yeah, if somebody listening wants to get these toxins tested, um, you can start with my book and, and learn about it and learn more and, and, and about what the testing is and, or just reach out to us and, and say, Hey, I, I heard the podcast and I want to get my toxin levels tested. We can get those labs shipped out to you. You do them at home. So it's very easy. Um, most toxins are tested in the urine because that's one the main way we're getting rid of them. Um, and so, yeah, we can definitely do that virtually. Perfect. Now, how can uh, people get a hold of you on social media and what is your website? Um, website is better. I'm, I'm trying to get a little more active on social media, but I, I'm not good at it. Because um, you're doing too many other things, probably. It's, yeah, it's, it's trying to be not, a doctor. Trying. <laughs> um, a but podcaster. I do, my, 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 my uh, page is doc uh, underscore cause, D O C uh, underscore K O Z. Um, my website is doc dash cause.com D O C dash K O Z.com. And on my, and I have a Facebook page, which is just, um, uh, my name, Peter Kozlowski, MD. Um, the, my website has a link to both of my books. The first one unfunk your gut is all about really the gut good. and food. Yeah. And this one, get the funk out is all about hormones and toxins and Love it. both books are spelled funk with a c um and it's from we had a saying at my practice that we put the funk in functional medicine um so that's where the titles come from but um both are available on barnes and noble or amazon or whatever and and there's a link on my website doc-cause.com that's good because somebody might think it was something else that you were meaning. <laughs> but that's how it is, started, but it got it's, it, I, it, either more. way. It's good. Uh, I I like a catchy title, and uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. I love learning more about how we can all take better care of our health. And uh, I wish you great success with the book. And uh, as always, you guys. Keep on keeping on.